G'day folks. And uh, even though it's your last session over there, and you may be sad and regretting that, uh, having to get up at 4am to do these sessions is sort of uh, not exactly something we're too regretful. We've enjoyed the sessions, uh, but it is a little taxing in terms of time. Uh, our subject today, well, if you want a streaming copy of it, or a video copy of it, an MP4 or whatever technology you've got, we've recorded this type of material over and over again in different formats. There's the video we did at Griffith University many years ago to a group of about 300 uh, um, teenagers, students, etc. We'll talk more about that. It's called Creation, the Final Proof. And it does deal with the issue of everything from matchsticks to men on how you would actually recognize whether something has been created or not, because it's a common belief out there that creation is just a religious concept. It's nothing to do with practical reality. It's a belief system only. Um, and when they make new spaceships or whatever, they never think of the term creation. Although the news commentators are usually forced to use that word because there's no other word that replaces it. If you talk about an evolution of a spaceship, well, technically, historically, that's probably a correct use of the word, but better is the creation concept. So I'm going to go mainly to PowerPoints and have a couple of breaks to come back on screen where we can do some demonstrations. You see, as I've given this lecture over the years, I've discovered one thing. This needs a big classroom, lots of space for illustrations where I can throw things around and, 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 and use all of those sort of things. I haven't got that today, so if I knock anything over, you'll just have to forgive me because it's me that'll have to clean up the mess. Okay, creation, the final proof. Um, let's have a look at some new creations. You see, when we go to Jurassic Ark, we installed that creation. Oh, not me. I'm a very post-creation guy descended from Adam with a little problem called sin, which destroys most things. You see our new creation behind me? We installed our giant goanna based on a fossil found only 180 kilometers from this room. Um, there's Craig from Tasmania. There's me. And there's our giant goanna. Yes, enormous. It's definitely a post-flood fossil. It's just buried in the soils around the Darling Downs. And... Uh, it's not a whole fossil, it's in bits and pieces. It wasn't buried suddenly, but it was buried and preserved. It's a giant goanna. How do we know that? Bone for bone, tooth for tooth, jaw for jaw, it's exactly the same. There was a time when goannas used to be monsters. And by the way, did you catch that I said, it's our newest creation? We know that because we put it there. We know that because we paid the artist for actually designing that, well, 3D looking mural at Jurassic Ark and we put it there. It didn't get there by itself. You can go to Jurassic Ark. You can see some of our experiments. Oh, what are we experimenting with? How vertical fossil trees fall. You see this nice tank here? It didn't happen by itself. I deliberately organized it based on an admiralty report many, many years ago where a ship's captain was in trouble with their lordships for actually running into a tree in the middle of the Atlantic. And the tree was floating vertically, just like the polystrate trees. And Joseph has already given you an introduction to uh, thorns. Well, there's some of my fossil thorns. Joe's are all right. They're nearly as good as mine, but not quite. Um, see my finger for scale? Now, in England, these exist in a rock that's called Carboniferous. Now, Carboniferous as a word didn't happen by itself. It was a created word. Um, no, it wasn't created back in the beginning. It was created in 1822. And it simply means has lots of carbon in it. You know, the coal fields of England, you can put the name Phillips and Coney Bear, Reverend Coney Bear with it. Some people call him Coney Bear, take your pick. Um, and they wrote a book called Outlines of the Geology of England and Wales. Now, when you look at my fossil, yes, it's a different specimen, but can you see the nice sharp barbs, thorns, prickles? Oh, Joseph discussed all of that. And uh, it doesn't matter what people call them. If you fell on them, you got the point. But these two guys uh, in their outlines of geology of England, Wales, they use the fossils to sequence layers. 
But you see, 1822 was before Charles Lyell. 1822 was before Charles Darwin. 1822, they weren't into hundreds of millions of years at all. In fact, they were both progressive catastrophists. Um, they were adding more catastrophes producing the layers than just Noah's flood. And the, the editorial on these guys in the research articles I've looked up over the years, yes, I've known about these two guys for years. Yes, I've collected in the Carboniferous in England and Canada. Um, not in the USA. They don't have it in the USA. They call it something else. But the guy said, the editor said, these guys didn't worry about the inconsistencies. They didn't go into the details, the conflicts between their overall belief about creation and Noah's flood versus what they were really suggesting. Remember, uh, Stina, they were going to lead to old earth thinkers and eventually abandonment of Christianity and uh, biblical catastrophism and creation. But yet what we're about at this conference is that. You see, we make no pretense. We are Christians and we are aiming to get you to think like Jesus thinks. Paul wrote, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. And it refers to far more than the morality that's just discussed in the rest of the chapter. So if you are trying to put this in a biblical Christ-centered thought, the Bible says there were no thorns, no things to make a point in you until after Adam sinned. Now that Carboniferous rock does not end up being hundreds of millions of years old like it is in the textbook. It's really post-Adam six or so thousand years ago. Question, how do you think about this beach? Because we were in Tasmania recently and we went to that beach. Where are we? Northern Tasmania, just on the left-hand bank of the Tamar River, just north of Launceston. And who's there on this cool day? Well, the answer is Craig Hawkins and Diane Eager. So no need to just take my word for it. Diane's there with you at the conference. Go and talk to her. You see, we were looking at this here, see the black, white, black, white, black, white layers? And it's brown, white, brown, white, brown, white, and then sandstone, siltstone, sandstone, siltstone. Because Craig have noticed these quite a while ago, and I've been looking forward to getting to see them. I remember our strata machine we did, an alternative way of looking at rock layers. You see, the normal person would say very slow deposition, cold, um, catastrophism, no, uh, slow deposition, yes. But if you're going to think like Jesus, if you're going to let his mind be in you, now for those of you who aren't Christians, sorry if that offends you, but in reality, you only have two choices. Let the mind of man be in you and have the limitations of that, or let the mind of Christ be in you, and the Bible claims he's the creator. So question, you Craig Hawkins, you're sitting on a rock, waiting for John Mackay to take a picture. Well, maybe not sitting. That was a, a, a different shot. Um, there he is, and there's a big glacial boulder. Well, there are mountains behind us. You can't see them in the picture. But that day, me, the Queenslander, the tropical person, froze to death with the wind that was coming down. Where would you put the glacial? Well, there's no ice mentioned in God's word, in the Bible, in the biblical history, until after Noah. And what would you do with this? You see, that's what our conference has been about, taking you out on the field, getting you to think again. Uh, these kids who are visiting from Melbourne and coming to sunny Queensland, there's two fossils. Oh, there's me at the back, and there's our new, well, it's a Spinosaurus. It's our new cast. It was revealed at Jurassic Ark just last Saturday. Uh, Spinosaur, Cretaceous, or talk to Joe. That's a word that simply means chalky. It doesn't mean dinosaurs. It doesn't mean millions of years. It was just named after what it was like. Question, where would you put that? Oh, you see, Spinosaurs, all things are made by Christ and for Christ. If you're trying to think biblically, then not only does it tell you to have the mind of Christ in you, it says they were made by Christ. So don't be surprised he expects you to think his way. He didn't let them evolve. They didn't happen by accident. They were made by Jesus Christ and for Jesus Christ. Creation is not only in Genesis chapter 1. It's all through the New Testament as well. So look, there's our fossil lady. 
uh, not fossilized in the sense of age like me. That's Karen, who helps organize our fossils and categorize them and file them so uh, they are all just organized. Hey, cute picture, eh? Where would you put Spinosaur in history? The answer is after Adam. Do you realize that if you take what we're saying today on creation, the final proof, the fact that you can actually establish this, then you end up with radical views to most of the world? Oh, and you see, when you're dealing with my lovely wife, there she is. We're just about to bid farewell to the visitors from Melbourne. And there's my wife. What a lovely smile. What a lovely lady. But I've already told you, pray for her because she's suffering from dementia. Where do you put dementia? Well, God made everything very good. Dementia is a post-fall, post-flood, post-Christ um, effect. It's not very good. Now, there's an outline. And in fact, if you want to be able to recognize design in this whole issue, then just think carefully. Uh, do you notice we've um, got an interesting picture there of dinosaurs? We've used it for years, but we've actually got several versions of it. There's another one. And you know very well that logo thing didn't happen by itself. You can go and look at all our Q&A site, or you can have a look at the one we designed for Joe and I. Did you catch it? Nobody believes that happened by itself. Look at Joe, look at me, look at the Neanderthal. Um, they were all put into place by an intelligent designer. I know that because Joe designed it. He existed before it, he's not a part of it, and he's smarter than it. Joe and Diane put that together. So how would we recognize design? How do we define it? How would we actually show the proof of creation and why? Secret location on the South Coast, just like in a World War II novel, isn't it? Um, what we're doing is going to a abandoned boatyard that was pushed into the sea back in the 50s. It's now become fossil junk. Oh, there's my colleague there. We're actually excavating. Welcome to fossil junk, Aussie style. Man, there's heaps and heaps of junk, but it didn't just wash away like the illegal owner hoped it would. It's still there showing all the evidence of a designer. Oh, what's that? That's a roll of fencing wire. And how do we know it was designed? Well, first of all, a couple of helpful definitions. Designed is the same as made. Nobody believes wire rolled up by itself. Oh yeah, the wire itself is metal. It's been put into long, thin strips and then rolled up. Designed equals made. Everyone believes that. Made equals created. But of course, created implies somebody who existed before it. And in the big picture, the creation of man, as opposed to matchsticks, nobody's objecting to a man making a matchstick out of a broken pine tree, but they object to a man being made out of dirt by the creator, Jesus Christ. So how would you recognize creation, design, manufacture? I mean, there's in the same junk heap. That's a piece of electrical wiring with uh, insulation around it. In fact, when you look, we can define a creation because that soft drink bottle, a creation, yep, it was created, everyone believes that. A creation has properties, it was designed, and the design has properties, they don't come from the glass. Somebody made a mold, an injection mold, and they pumped glass into it and showed the evidence of how intelligent they are. The bottle is made a certain thickness so the gas never blows the bottle up. Intelligent design is never the result of just the interaction of silica and oxygen and metal and soft drink um, through time. You see, design always indicates a pre-existent mind. Now, we don't mind admitting the man who designed matchsticks, but many of us struggle with actually admitting the Christ of the creation in Genesis. You did catch what I said, didn't you? When people say God created everything, yep, and the word God is just a position, not a name. The word Jesus Christ, or the name Jesus Christ, is a particular identifier. The God of creation is named Jesus Christ, all through the New Testament. No one has any trouble recognizing design. The only problem is admitting who the designer was. Now, what's the background to this issue here? Well, here's a very helpful definition. No, I didn't make it up, but boy, did I cash in on it. I was doing a debate when my opponent, a professor, got up 
and he was trying to belittle the whole issue. And he said, a creation is something that can't happen by itself. Oh, who said this? Well, his name was Dr. Chris DeCarlis, Harvard University. We were having a debate at Guelph University. And I mean, it was a fantastic debate. He lost. He lost big time. In fact, one of our supporters said, I just had to go up and give him a hug and encourage him because he was so badly defeated. Well, that's not my words. That's one of the audience. I, I happen to agree with it. Now, that's background number one, because he lost badly, because when he finished saying that, I just whipped out one of my Aboriginal implements that had not happened by itself. It was a creation. So whether we're talking about matchsticks that didn't happen by themselves, or men for who the Bible says didn't happen by themselves, we are talking about the subject of creation. And of course, there's a second issue here, and that is the background that you can now get off our websites, um, the search for the origin of life. Where did it come from? Well, switch me back on the full screen, Joe, so I can actually show these people here. Okay, you want to put me on full screen, Joe? Joe, are you alive still there? Okay, there we are. Whoops, no, I disappeared again. It initially started with this debate, the education debate. I'd been asked to go to Canada and do a debate. The local education department in Saskatchewan had said, could you come and do a debate? And they couldn't find any one professor who opposed me. So this is a debate against four professors from the University of Saskatchewan at once. And the good news is four people don't make any more evidence for, evolu for evolution than one person. And there is no evidence. Yes, I'm very bold and brassy on that. And they lost big time. So then the education department said, can you come and show us how to teach creation? So we did. And that's where the, or the origin of that text series, the search for the origin of life comes. So we've been working on this program for many, many years, decades, in fact. And we've given that in classrooms all over the planet. And it's a really effective look because you can start with matches. You can start with motor cars. And no one thinks of religious objections to that until you get to the issue of creation of man. And then it's all religious. The reality is the evidence is the same in both cases, the type of evidence. And that's what this program is going to be about. So back on, on screenshot again, please. Yeah. Um, if you want to look up more on this, then I've got it up. You better put me back on, on the um, what are we, PowerPoint. Joe, can you do that? Speed of sound is slowing down. There we are. Just go to creationresearch.net and search the topic of design. Because over the years, Diane, who's responsible for much of the content on the Q&A, on the fact file, has filed an awful lot of information on the subject of design. But overall, we rec ad admit to that. No one has any trouble recognizing design. The only problem is admitting who the designer was. So in this part two, notice my question, why is this the problem? Why can we recognize a design of a Coke bottle, a design of a, a screen, a design of a room or a house, but have trouble admitting a design by Jesus Christ? Well, let's have a look at what his word says. Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, Genesis 1.26, Genesis 1.31, summary. You can recognize creation by design because the Bible says everything got here by creation. The whole universe is a creation. It, it, it happened pretty quickly. Six days is the total time allowed in Genesis. Genesis 1.26, we were made in the image of this creator God. So we were created. We show all the evidence in ourselves. In fact, we can understand creation because we were made as the reflection of the God who created us. A reflection, by the way, is not the reality. The reality is God, the creator, and we reflect his abilities. So we can create matchsticks because he could create men. We're not crash hot at making men from dust. Uh, I mean, we can make men into dust. We can't go the other way. So when you have a look at Genesis 1, 26, that's why we can actually think carefully because God is a thinker. Genesis 1, 31 is emphatic. Everything began very good. But then in Genesis 3, you discover the Bible says there's a problem. 
God made the world good. Don't you dare blame him for the problems with the gas pipes in the, uh, in, in the sea at the moment. Um, there's a problem called sin. Adam disobeyed God and uh, the problem has continued to the present. So look what it says. Now, those of you not Christians looking at this, you mightn't like this because the first time I read this, well, I didn't like much about what this said either. Jeremiah, it's a fairly very disappointing book to read because it's so depressing because the people of Israel had actually turned away from the God who blessed them. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. Yes, you know that's true of your neighbor. You know it's true of your grandfather. But you, well, the Bible says it's true of every one of us. There's a problem in how we see things. In fact, by the time we get to the New Testament, the book of Romans, for the wrath of God, the anger of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, anything that's not good, anything that's not godly. It's unrighteous. It's the unrighteousness of men. They hold the truth. They know the truth. They hold it, but they actually see it backwards. They deal with it upside down. They use good to achieve evil because that which may be known of God is shown to them. It's actually made known in them for God has showed it to them. Yes, good old King James, because that's where I read this first. For the invisible things of God from the creation of the world are clearly seen. That's by everyone who's alive at the moment. Everyone who's ever been alive from Adam onwards. And they are understood by the things that are made, even as eternal Godhead and power, so that men are without excuse. Oh, now, that means yeah. Richard Dawkins, David Attenborough, managers of the BBC, um, it means the man managers of magazines that are so atheistic, it's hard to read them sometimes. It means the chief of the LGBTPQ, whatever that name are these days, they all know about God. They all know that God created. <clears throat> they all actually see the evidence and they understand it. So uh, the only thing you need to go from there is that. Bible is emphatic. <clears throat> Without the mind of Christ, our sinful natures stops us not seeing the evidence. Uh, it stops us admitting it. So the how-to of creation involves something more than just the created object thinking the issue through. So how would we recognize the design? Because people say, oh, I can't see any evidence of creation. Number one, gently call them a liar because that's what they are even with David Attenborough or Richard Dawkins or that, that Bill Nye or any of these guys, they can see it, they can recognize it, they understand it, they know exactly what they're doing. They're lying to you. Let's prove it to you. Now, I was traveling up just over the border of Scotland uh, one year, and you know that famous Scottish uh, tennis player, Andy, this is not far from his place. Um, okay, isn't that a pretty Scottish scene? Uh, look, full of trees. But which tree was designed? Which tree was made? Which tree was created? Can you spot it? Well, welcome to Telephone Towers, UK style. I don't know who came up with this idea, but it didn't happen by itself. You see, that's a made ma made tower, man-made. We know we, we it wasn't there before we put it there. So there's our concept again. If you're talking about design, you're talking about made, you're talking about created, you're talking about a creation is, and there's a very practical definition. No, not mine originally, Professor Christa Carlos. It's a brilliant definition because he hoped that we'd end up poking fun at creation, at creationists. In reality, it provides a very useful link. A creation is anything, including this PowerPoint, that can't happen by itself. Conclusion, all known design, whether it's the tree that's artificial or the trees that are growing there, that are far smarter because, come on, let's admit it, telephones, towers, you want a second one? You have to make it. You want a second tree? Just grab a seed and it makes itself. Amazing. Oh, but the seed is actually the end result of a creation in the beginning. Self-making trees, what a great idea. It'd be greater if we could get self-making towers, hey, but we can't do that yet. All known design is not the result of the interaction of matter and energy. Um, matter, design, Let's give you some definitions. That's what you'll need to do when you're actually thinking through this issue. Design results from adding information to a system which cannot generate that information itself. So if you want to cook a plate full of jellyfish, yeah, some people do this. 
and in reality, it won't happen by itself. What's the inflammation? The cooking pot, the heat. Uh, don't heat it too much because it'll all evaporate. You have to add information, a system. The information can't be generated by the system itself. Oh, but what's information? Now, over the years, I've become famous or infamous or notorious for, for reminding people that where something comes from tells you what it's made. And what it means tells you what it's worth. So information, where's the word from? You can trace it back to Latin. It came via the old French through Middle English to modern English. Yes, the Romans didn't leave much Latin in England, but the French via the Normans, 1066 and all that, they did. And it came to modern English. And when you look at it, information, you want to get facts into someone to help form their mind so that the mind can be where it should be at. Let this mind be in you. But don't be surprised. The Bible also tells you study God's word to show yourself approved. Get his mind in you. You'll need his information. You won't do it naturally because the Bible is emphatic. There's a problem with your natural mind. I know it's offensive. It's offensive to me, too, because I like to think I'm self-sufficient. And the Bible says, forget it. You're not. In fact, when you have a look, information always means mind uh, outside of you, by the way. This refers to the information of the creator because the Bible is emphatic that there's the implication. A creation is an end product which has properties that do not come from the stuff it's made of. <clears throat> I mean, think carefully. Your body alive, your body dead, the actual atoms are exactly the same. Um, the end product, the body has properties that don't come just from the carbon or the hydrogen. In fact, if you go one step further, nor are those properties derived from any naturally generated random source. Oh, the opposite of evolution. Millions of years of time, random interactions of matter and energy produces life. And the Bible says it doesn't. The Bible says, in fact, run a test. You won't get a Nobel Prize by waiting around for molecules to become living. Um, try it. You won't get a Nobel Oh, You want to make life in a test tube? Use your brain's to put molecules to do things that they normally don't, uh, even with books. Let's slip in a sneaky commercial. There's a book I wrote taking my grandchildren to Jurassic Park. Joseph is with me. What happened to the dinosaurs? It's available from our website. It's probably available at your conference. The kids love it. The parents love it. And nobody believes those pictures happened by themselves. They were designed. They were made. They were created. That's the definition. That's what we're talking about, whether it's artwork or Adam. There we are visiting Jurassic Ark and our Jurassic Ark Jeep. And do you see the uh, footprint on the top right hand side? <clears throat> Wherever you see one of those footprints in this book, it tells you some information. Get your camera, your camera and your phone, the one you've downloaded the app in the front of the book. It's a free app, by the way, and free you can all afford. And when you bring this up, uh, click on the picture or shoot the picture with your camera that's downloaded. And let's see if it's actually transferred across here. It's supposed to go here. It's not going to do such a thing. Let's try it. Ah, oh, terrible. Joe will have to show it to you. It's supposed to come alive like it does normally when I, <coughs> I click this button. But either way, the <coughs> I'm going to grab my mouthful of water here. Either way, the picture or the embedded video actually does something spectacular that didn't happen by itself. Remember Chris DeCarlis? Yeah, I hope you're not bored because we're really saying the same thing over and over again. But we do this for a whole six weeks, one lesson a, a, a week to actually help high school kids. And you can get all through this and the kids didn't recognize you were talking religion at all. Because if they want to gain a position in life, they have to learn all about creation. Whether they're going to create new cakes whether they're going to create new housing designs, whether they're going to create computers. Creation is actually part of success in life. All right. Um, Joe, I'm going to put myself on a blank here. If you will uh, just bring up the screenshot again, please. Now, let me just illustrate this. Because where are we? I have here a piece of cardboard. I have here some scissors. Everyone knows these scissors didn't happen by themselves. Somebody who existed before it, somebody who's not a part of it, actually took the metal 
and the plastic sharpened the edges and they made it so we can cut. So let's take this piece of cardboard and I'm going to use my intelligence and I'm going to cut out this thing here. Yes, you can see why we need a nice big classroom and the kids can all do this. It's a very simple illustration. Let's put the bottom bit down there. Look, I, I've made something. In fact, let's go one step further. We're going to go up to there. And what we are doing is a very simple issue. Let's make sure that this comes there. Then I'll tuck this around in here and I'll go a little further. Have you noticed, by the way, that people love watching you do things? Because creation is actually a very intriguing issue. We like to watch somebody else make things, whether it's a fruitcake. Uh, we like to eat them better than watching them. But there's a, a mysticism in saying, what's it actually going to turn into? Um, when You know, you go along the coastline and you see somebody painting and you stand there and you watch them. What'd you do that for? They're just slopping color around. But not even the color happened by itself. You see, we can take the colors and we make the art there we are. One last cut there. Now, what have we made? Ah, well, should we read it that way? An intelligent D sign. Uh, did you catch that? A good play on words, intelligent design. In fact, because I'm super intelligent, I'm sort of at the other end of the spectrum. Now, that's my self-opinionated version. But you see, this intelligent D sign um, well, intelligent design is poo-pooed by much of science, isn't it? They don't know what they're talking about. A, they know about creation. B, they recognize design. C, they deny it. They are lying to you when they say intelligent designs are fancy, fanciful. They're just mystical. Actually, because, as I said, in my opinion, I'm at the other end of the spectrum. You watch what I can do. When you look at this thing here, I've made myself a pair of you know Eskimo glasses that's that's how they make them in fact intelligent design is absolutely necessary uh, in life if you want to teach kids to get ahead you need to teach them to be designers whether it's with cloth whether it's with food whether it's with motor cars or spaceships in fact when we have a look at the whole issue here we asked professor ed nealon canada he's a professor who's one of the most popular and unpopular professors in his university at the same time. Many of the admin, they struggle with the fact that Ed's a Christian and Ed believes that God created. He's not only an intelligent designer, he's a Christian creationist. In fact, can I encourage you, grab some of the DVDs or get them streamed uh, or get the MP4s or whatever you get these days and you'll see some of the arguments Professor Ed Nealon makes. And the fact is, many of the chemicals actually illustrate one thing. Life had to happen really fast. But that's where we'll get to right at the end. Uh, his logic is simple. Some of the chemicals actually self-disintegrate. They self-destruct within a very quick period of time. No matter how big they are or how little they are, they almost have a self-destruct timing mechanism built into them. Oh, see what's behind me? You don't believe any of these things happen by accident. You actually know they were ex made by someone who existed before it. Joe, it takes me on to the uh, next screen, please. Once I can find where my cursor's gone. There we are. We'll bring it back down here. Uh, sorry, Joe, I've lost my cursor. How do I get it back? It's on the wrong screen. I might have to go this way. There we are. Now, what's a boomerang? Oh, yes. When I, when I do this in public, that's what I usually start with. That's what I whipped out at our debate where Professor Chris DeCarla said, a creation is anything can't happen by itself. So I whipped out my boomerang. And I simply said, what's a boomerang? Because in the end, there's one of the simplest definitions. A boomerang, an Aussie boomerang, is famous because it comes back. It's a 100% returning object made of 100% non-returning wood. The property of coming back does not come from the tree. Uh, well, you know, the illustration of you, I've used it in England, I've used it in Ireland, used it in Scotland, used it in America. Um, you see, my ancestors are well experienced with this. 
we Scots have been throwing trees for a long time and not one of them's come back. So the wood does not possess the property of coming back. And yet the boomerang does because we added it by changing the ends of the structure and making them, them a slightly different angle. In fact, the boomerang, the end product has properties that do not come from the stuff it's made of. Isn't that simple? That's where most people go wrong when they make a boomerang. They don't get the ends right. They just see the overall shape and they added information to the wood, but they didn't add the right information or they didn't add enough information. And if you walk into a room and you see a boomerang on a table, on the floor, hanging up in the sky or flying through the air, you know it means somebody existed before the boomerang, somebody's not a part of the boomerang, and somebody's smarter than the boomerang because they made the wood do what wood won't. Yeah, um, that, that's what a boomerang is. It's a created object. Now, do you see the principle? Um, when you make a boomerang, and not only can you see properties added to the wood, you can see the result of those properties, even if you never saw the person make it. You're catching on? Because when you're dealing with biblical creation, it's not a religious concept. I guess it's got religious implications. The God who created man owns man. Oh, the person who created the boomerang from the tree owns the boomerang. Hey, there's all sorts of legal implications here. You can decide what you do with that boomerang. Wow, you could actually chop it up if you wanted to. That's your authority as the creator. Now, we don't like thinking about the fact that the God who created man out of dust actually owned the dust. The God who created man from the dust actually owns the man and has the right to tell you what to do. The God who created man on the sixth day actually invented time and you don't have any time to waste. It's all his. He will hold you accountable for wasting his time. Man, are there implications here? But in reality, if you're trying to make something, time is an interesting issue. Do you realize in making a boomerang, you can't take forever. Time is your enemy, not your friend in this world. I mean, ever since Adam sinned, time has been a negative. What do I mean? You get the right tree. You find the right root. If many of the boomerangs are made of, of root bends and, and you shape it up and you get halfway there and say, oh, I'm tired, my back hurts, and you put your boomerang down on the ground and decide to come back in 87 years. Well, time, chance, waits for no man. Weather destroys things even faster. You've only got as long to make a boomerang as the wood takes to rot. You've only got as long to make a man as the shortest lived chemical in man. Did you catch that? Have a look at Ed Nealon's production. You'll find that's a vital point that he makes. You can't take any longer to make a boomerang than the wood takes to rot. You can't take any longer to make a man than the shortest lived chemical because there's chemicals in your body that help you do digestive things. They're enzymes. They're put into existence. They actually speed up a reaction and then they get cancelled out. Why? Because if they kept staying there, enzymatically aiding the reaction, you would finally cook yourself to death. You don't have very long. In fact, his estimation is you've got about a 15,000th of a second with many of these reactions before if you don't have them, you're in trouble. Time is your enemy, not your friend in the world. Now, Joe, I need you to actually put me back on screen here just for one last demonstration before we uh, click conclude here. Do, do you see John Mackay's time tower? Look at that. I made that. I mean, isn't that a magnificent engineering construction? And uh, I'm just going to sit it there. Yes, it hides my face nicely. I'm going to put it probably on this side. And um, it's Lego. Now, one year, we had a, a family competition. You know, the kids are growing up. They've all got Lego. Some of them are nearly teenagers. And we have a competition because the little kids like to play with Lego. And then you've got to add those robot bits and the electronic bits. And Lego gets very expensive. So we actually got all our Lego kits together. And we decided, hey, we're in a room. The ceiling is nearly four meters tall. Who can build a tower to reach from the floor to the ceiling? Four meters of Lego without it falling down. And I tell you what, the competition went on for ages. And no, I didn't win. 
one of the teenagers or sub teens actually won. He built his Lego tower slowly, painfully, and it was taller than him. And he kept adding the bits and the bits, just like I did with this one. I made this for demonstration purposes. Got a wide base, then a, a, a narrower base, then a narrower base, then a narrow base. Then you know, like most of the buildings have a crane on the top where they can hang window cleaners. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty structurally competent uh, towers. But the one thing I've noticed is it may take you ages to build that tower. It did take us a long time. But you know what happened to most of them? One movement. And look at all that's left. Oh, but that's that's not the point. That's fun. We tried to have a competition that there's a very simple point. When I look at the bits that came off this tower, um, they're all lying here on the table. But here's the challenge for you. It took me maybe half an hour to find the bits in our Lego kit that would build this thing. It didn't take me half an hour to build it, but in reality, it took me half a second to destroy it. Question, how long will it take those blocks to put themselves back together again? Because there's the issue when it comes to evolution, the blocks of chemicals called amino acids, the blocks of chemicals called carbohydrates, the blocks of chemicals called enzymes, very sophisticated chemicals. How long will they take to put themselves together from the Lego chemical blocks called carbon or hydrogen? The answer is never. They'll never put themselves together in a way that would build a body. Oh, yes, I know we find amino acids in space. You find left-handed ones and right-handed ones. And for those of you that don't do chemistry, you'll find that if you try to use right-handed amino acids in your body, it doesn't really actually work. Um, you will find that you have to have not only the right chemicals, but the right isomer of the chemicals. It gets that specific. Uh, so when you have a little analogy like this, think carefully. You will find that time is not your friend. You can't say, give us any time. Okay, Joe, back on the uh, PowerPoint again, mate, to finish off here. All right, we've done our timetable. We've done our time tower in, and you know the time, the answer to the question, that those blocks will never make a, a, a tower by themselves. Very simple. A creation is something. I, I mean, it was so simple, that tower. I just took the Lego blocks and put them one on top of the other. But not even that can happen by itself, whether it's Lego or chemicals. You see, the end product has properties. I designed that tower. Pretty pathetic design. Didn't even last one minor earthquake. The end product has properties that do not come from the Lego blocks it was made of. A creation always proves that. Somebody who is not a part of it, somebody who existed before it, and somebody who's smarter than it actually made it. Hmm. Okay, simple illustration. I first heard this from dear old beloved Gary Parker. He was um, uh, actually a professor of genetics when I was doing genetics, and he was an atheist then. Uh, but next time I met him, he was a Christian creationist, and we used his textbooks at Queensland University, but they banned his books when he became a Christian creationist. He used to use this illustration, not the same way I do, but it makes the same point. What's a jumbo jet? Well, they're out of date even now, but a jumbo jet is that. A 100% flying object made from 100% non-flying parts. Simple? You can prove that easily. Take the hostess and throw her out the door. She doesn't fly. Drop the tail off. The tail doesn't fly by itself. Throw the wheels away. They don't fly by themselves. Drop off a jet engine and it doesn't fly by itself. A jumbo jet is a 100% flying object made from non-flying parts. What's a computer code? Look at that. It's a 100% meaningful result made from 100% meaning-free source. Oh, can you see an issue? Why is it over the right-hand side? Well, anybody who knows anything about PowerPoint knows that didn't happen by itself. It's something ever so simple. John Mackay actually pressed one little instruction and zoom, all the text shifts over. But it doesn't happen by itself. You see, even that shift is a created result. A creation is something that cannot happen by itself. Don't get bored. Learn this off by heart. Share it with the non-Christian who wants to continue believing a lie that you can't see the evidence of creation. Of course you can. Anything where the end product 
has properties that don't come from the stuff it's made of. Flour does not shape itself into sponge cakes. Metal does not make itself into cars. You see, all of them acknowledge the existence of somebody who is smarter than them, existed before them, so therefore praise mum for the fact that she made the sponge cake. Praise the engineer for the fact that he found out how to design a motor car and put non-moving metal to make it move. Uh, brings us up to this. What's DNA? Well, DNA is a code. DNA is a 100% coded substance made from 100% non-coded parts. I remember our professor struggling in genetics to try and tell us where DNA came from. In fact, he couldn't even tell you where evolution came from or how it worked. He, uh, he believed it, but he didn't know anything about how even DNA, which is such a sophisticated, one of the most sophisticated molecules in the whole universe, 100% coded substance made from 100% carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, none of which do codes by themselves. Did you catch that? In fact, that's going to bring us up to our really final and important points in this debate. Um, DNA is 100% coded substance made from 100% non-coded parts, and it possesses an inbuilt mechanism to make copies of itself. You know, we are just beginning to get onto the edge of how to get a computer to make an identical computer. By the way, your bodies do this pretty good. It's called having kids. Um, um, code on your computer, unless you put an inbuilt mechanism to copy codes, it won't do it by itself. In fact, what you're looking at is the original DNA, original DNA, where would you see original DNA? Shows all the evidence of a pre-existing intelligent creator. Why do I say that? The fact that DNA produces copies of its cells means that you, this copy in this generation came from the copy in the last generation that had a copy mechanism, that had a copy mechanism, copy, 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 all the way back to the first DNA, which shows all the evidence in past and present of being unable to manufacture the code all by itself. Oh, what can happen, the code can go wrong so that my wife has actually got a problem. John Mackay was born with a genetic problem. That's why I un undertook genetics at Queensland University to find out what the chances would be of my kids having that same genetic issue. So how can we take this and turn it into, uh, what do you call a standard science? Give us equations, give us formulas, give us, give us constructions that will tell us how to make, give us algorithms, all of those sort of things. What's a boomerang? There it is. You took wood, you took power, you took a bit of your time, and you made a boomerang. But that's a lie. That's not how it happened. Here's how it happened. You added information to wood, time, and power. Yes, you'd previously made a, an electric saw. You'd previously found a tree or the root, and you used your time. Well, actually, the Bible says it's God's time, and you put the three of those together along with the right information, then you threw the stick, and if it didn't come back, you called it a stick. The dog got it. If it did come back, you've made a boomerang. Let's reduce this a little. And yes, you'll see all of this on Creation of the Final Proof or all on our textbook we did for schools. It'd be great if someone would fund turning this into a fabulous book for, for everybody around the planet. Information added to the parts, the wood and the time and uh, yeah, the power, and it turns into a product. Notice what we've done. Information has become I. Parts have become little p. Product has become big P. Okay. What are you supplying? The information there is what makes the parts into the product. In fact, when you look at this and ask that question, which has more information, the little p or the big p? The answer is the big p. You added information. It never happened by itself. You're the source. You made this thing get created. You made this thing get designed. The evidence, that's where it shows. Now, that's more like algorithm. That's more like a formula. That's more like a little instruction. Whenever you see the information in the product being greater than the information in the parts, you are talking about a creator who existed before his creation. You are talking about a creator who existed before her creation. You are talking about somebody who is not a part of the object, somebody who pre-exists the object, and somebody who is smarter, and they took their smarts and they added part of it 
to the wood. Oh, they kept part of it themselves too. Uh, you could write it another way. Whenever the information in the product divided by the information in the parts is greater than one, you are talking about a creation. So when you try to answer this, what's a boomerang, a car, a jumbo jet, computer card, DNA light, or mankind? Um, the answer is simple. They all show evidence of intelligent design. But more than that, they show evidence of intelligent designer. And that's where the intelligent designer people need to actually come to grips with the reality. You can't just talk about intelligent design. A matchstick is intelligent design. And we made it. Nobody worries at all about you having any authority over matchsticks unless you use it to burn down the pine forest in California or the eucalyptus forest, which burn a whole lot better. Um, then you'll be in trouble. But when it comes to mankind, they don't like the implication. And remember the role of time? Boomerangs, you can't take forever to make a boomerang, it'll rot. You've only got as long as the metal takes to rust to finish your car. You actually need to have air with certain properties or your jumbo jet won't work at all. Um, jumbo jets won't do you much good <laughs> unless there's air. And when you've got a computer code, you have to know what the computer code is designed to do before you put it in the computer to actually do the thing that is what you want done. And DNA, a very sophisticated organic computer code with a, with a self-manufacturing instruction. And that's what life is. You see, whether you're an amoeba, whether you're a molecule that's in part of a euglena, or whether you are mankind, you are somebody who can't have taken forever to make. Well, remember Ed Nealens? Have a look at his DVD, because he says the longest you've got is the time it takes for those enzymes that actually enable you to get energy out of your food and then self-cancel them before they end up destructing your whole body. Yeah maybe 15,000th of a second. In fact, when you look at mankind, the Bible says that not only were created by Christ, we are owned by Christ, and he made us on the sixth day. Didn't take the whole day. He made us probably before the coffee break on the sixth day because he was going to make Eve before the afternoon tea session, and he didn't take long for either of them. In fact, there's an implication here that you need to think through. When you have a look at our formulas, you know, information in the product is greater than information in the parts. That's a creation. Or when the information in the product divided by the information in the parts is greater than one, you actually have a creation. There's a corollary. When time approaches zero, the information available approaches infinity. Ah, God took six days, not because he needed it. He didn't take six days to make man. He made man in a fraction of time on the sixth day. The time was his invention. When time approaches zero, he didn't need six days to make the creation. Anyone who can make a universe can take as long as they like or as short as they like. But when the time approaches zero, the information being used approaches infinity. You see, the creation always proves that somebody who's not a part of it, somebody who existed before it and is smarter than it, deserves worship. Worship, worship, give them the credit that's due to their name. Uh, the Bible says, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And that's what it means. You are to worship God for his cleverness, for his greatness, for the fact that he made the beauty of this creation as well. I mean, it's not just a mechanical universe. The sky is blue because it looks pretty, as well as its filtering of stuff from outer space. Roses are beautiful colors, not because they're needed, um, but simply because, I mean, ask Dr. Diane about why snapdragons are colored. They don't need to be colored. No insect actually gets inside of them. They're pretty for your sake. And your sake was actually Christ's sake. You see, Colossians chapter 1 says all things were made by Christ. So let's have a look at some people who've made a final choice based on this. Meet a young lady. She phoned me up one day and said, can I come and see you? And she shared with me that she'd become a Christian. Look at that smile. And uh, in reality, both she and her sister have become Christians. Why? Because COVID was here and she said to me, I'd been to Jurassic Park, I'd heard from you, I, 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 I knew there was a creation, I knew it was true and I knew the creator had the right to judge me and send me to hell because the universe is his property. He has the right to make the rules. So I became a Christian and I led my sister to Christ and there's me preaching at their church not long ago 
they're both still going on. Ah, Colossians chapter 1. All things were made for Christ. This is, by the way, not just talking about you and me. It's talking about this young man. Look at him holding a marsupial lion tooth that I found on the Darling Downs. Yeah, you heard me right. We had marsupials with teeth like that. Man, what a fascinating Australia we live in. Well, the very next day, young Dan got saved. And, well, the creation, sin, sin's reality. Uh, but you see, God had opened his mind and Dan became a Christian as a result. And then I shared with him, because he's coming to see me today and we're going to have a meal together. And uh, I said, what you need to do is now go and get baptized. Well, there he is. Yes, not a fancy church, but a beach. And the elders in the church there went down to the ocean and baptized it just the same way that disciples would have done in the beginning. No, no fancy church fonts or anything like that. And what he's doing now? Pray for him. Pray for all these young people who become Christians because the Bible is true from the very beginning. Jesus is the creator. Jesus is the judge. He judged sin. He judged the flood. He judged through Babel. And then he came to die for us, you and me. Give him the glory that's due to his name. And don't put up for one moment with a nonsense that says, I can't see any evidence of creation or creator. In fact, take them through this DVD and then lead them to the creator who's none other than Jesus Christ. Don't you like that new logo? It didn't happen by itself either. Uh, we're grateful to Sam for coming up with the basic idea. We're grateful to our artists for coming up with the beautiful squash CD background. And we're grateful to, well, I design creationresearch.net, aren't I? Well, no, I'm nowhere near as clever as Sam or the other artists, but none of it happened by itself. Okay, switch me back on the full screen, Joseph, and we'll take some questions. Okay, last opportunity. Thank you very much, John. Can just check in. You can hear us okay? Yes, I can hear you okay. Good stuff. Great stuff. I'm going to come out the front then. And uh, now's our opportunity, our last opportunity, to take some questions from John. So has anybody got any questions for John about what he's spoken about tonight, i.e. design and creation? What he spoke about the first time, uh, which is the layers and liars. And we've been, uh, since that first evening, we've been seeing a lot of rock layers. So I'm sure you'll have some questions about that or the creation evolution topic in general. Any questions for John? Over the back here, I'm coming around. Uh, hi, John, thanks for that. Um, can we explain, is there a difference between the term creation and the term made? Um, in essence, there is, um, it's like, a red fading into pink you will find that creation is a concept where somebody actually has to exist before it but made is very similar and we often do this in our language because all our words are created we are word creators i mean when people got to australia they borrowed aboriginal words and now they've been taken all around the word we borrow words and we invent some words that never existed before we put them together from different pits like in formation we made the word but in reality it's just a sub variant of the concept of creation when you're talking about creation you can distinguish between human creation and the creator christ who's outside of his creation now i'm stuck inside the creation so the matchstick has to already be available in the pine tree but i didn't either make man or did i make the pine tree so i i made the matchstick but i also created it that's why when people talk about intelligent design, it just doesn't apply to sophisticated molecules in life. It applies right down to matchsticks and right up to man. So you intelligent designers who stop before you get to the biblical picture, don't. You need to go right through to the end and explain people uh, the fact that there's just a gradation from created, made and designed. Uh, they're all related to each other. Thanks for that. Any other questions for John this evening? Well, while you're thinking, Joe, let me uh, slip a commercial in. I'm assuming you've got some of these versions over there. No, uh, hopefully, you're not running out of them. More. We've completely run out of them. 
completely run out. You'll have to I reorder, Joe. Can so, yeah. you know, I encourage people? Joe needs all the financial help that you can give him, for both for yeah. our new museum and by the books that are there, and so we can reprint. It's a great book on introducing the Creator, uh, walking with Jesus through Genesis, because many evangelicals want to start walking with Jesus from Matthew. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John make no sense unless you start at Genesis. So a great Bible study in which we simply take a verse out of Genesis, a concept out of Genesis, and we follow it through in the New Testament. So two portions in every devotional, and you'll find it also has a Dreamer app in which you get free, free mini sermons from yours truly all the way through the book. You can watch on your iPhone and share with anybody. You will might find that really helpful. So walking with Jesus through Genesis, and Joe, I know you haven't got this yet, but this is you and me, isn't it? Not only does it remind people about our various museums around the planet, not only does it tell you who actually loved the book or whatever, but it gives you great information, you know, on all the different aspects of things that require not time, but process, whether it's stalactites uh, or whether it's, uh, you know, the or all of the things that we've been able to find, uh, the church tunnel, and all of this stuff that we showed you the other day. Order yours right now. I don't know what Joe's going to charge you for it. Hopefully it'll be a fortune or you'll donate a million dollars a copy or something like that. He's in desperate need for funds for his museum at the moment. So um, anybody got any other questions before we close off for the night? If I could just add one quick thing onto that, John. When I first started getting involved with creation research and I went to Australia essentially for training, one of the things that me and John would do regularly almost every morning is go through essentially what ended up in walking with Jesus through Genesis. And what's really fascinating is not only did John mentor me on this stuff, but John, you were mentored yourself on some of this stuff. I think it was, was it Alan, Alan White? Who, um, Alan Hall, yeah. Oh, that's right. Who did some uh, this kind of stuff. So it's been passed down sort of from generation to generation it's a fascinating study and i would love to be able to uh, get together if uh, if covid and laws and travel allows it and actually film because it's great having it down in the book but it'd be great to also film a discussion um between us doing uh, this sort of walking with jesus through genesis so lord willing we'll get some more of those printed soon lord willing version two will be out very soon and lord willing we'll actually have an opportunity to produce more of these sort of devotionals because the big thing about creation research is obviously the research we've been doing this all this week but that's not really our focus it's not our emphasis the emphasis is on the gospel of jesus christ strengthening christians and spreading the good news of jesus christ to all mankind and so when we say you know it's not just a research element and that means that we're not trying to um find favor in man's eyes in terms of academic standard or academic prestige we're trying to actually find evidence that not only glorifies god but also spreads the gospel of jesus christ and so a big emphasis is not just on the research it's also on the biblical side of things the devotional side of things the actually studying god's world in and god's word in order for the glory to, to, to you know continue um showing god's glory that he has created so a few thoughts there any any last questions or comments over from simon I think we're done joe hold on one more question from simon here we go hi john um you talked G'day, about the, the boomerang. can you speak up a bit louder simon you talked about the boomerang john tonight um i think i've heard you talk about this before but did uh the Australian Aborigines invent the boomerang, or did that come from India? And if so, um, you just um, talk about the relationship, therefore, between the people groups. Okay. Um, we do a whole big section on the origin of the races, and you can see quite a bit of that on our DVDs called History of Man, uh, Real Roots, uh, Origin of Races, uh, and The Devolution of Man. Right? Those four series are worth getting as a unit. But my observations are you will find boomerangs in India. You'll find boomerangs in, in Egypt. You see them painted on the walls of the pyramids. And in reality, the Australian Aborigines are not the people who invented the boomerang. They are the last people to keep using them. I mean, the modern Europeans try to use them. They're nowhere near as skillful as Aborigines unless they spend a huge amount of time practicing to get it to come back. 
there are two sorts of boomerangs. One is the throwing boomerang and the other is the killing boomerang. Now, if you go from Australia back to India, come with me to the Suntail Hills and you'll see people who look exactly like Aboriginals. You see people who have dingoes. You'll see people who have boomerangs, right? So you will find, put that in an evolutionary perspective and you have to say Aborigines designed the boomerang 40, 50,000 years ago. And in doing so, you are highly insulting them because 40,000 years of only throwing sticks, 40,000 years of having two musical instruments, one's a hollow log and the other's a stick to beat it with. You are not really saying too much to complement Aboriginal intelligence at all. When you look what's happened, Aborigines themselves tell you they arrived over here, particularly on the East Coast, after much war and fighting in the middle of the world. They are not indigenous in the normal sense uh, any more than someone who's lived here all their days is indigenous, who was born here. Man, there's a lot of politics involved in all of these uh, race issues, but Aboriginals are essentially Indian. Their genetics shows you that, right? They have the same genetic mistakes as the Dravidian people in India. They are coming from India, and it fits the Tower of Babel picture of a central group dispersing across the planet, some going south, some going east, some going west, some ending up in the USA, well, the Americas, and then set down to South America, and then back up, circling up to where the cyclone is this, these days. The, the um, people in Florida came from the south, and the people higher up came from the east, over where the sun rose is. I asked them, and they're mad as one thing at the European anthropologists who say the Native Americans all walk across from Alaska, and they say, no, we didn't. We came by boat from over the sunrise, and they left the Middle East. So what you find is much of European anthropology is is really pro-evolution, and it's not, uh, not accurate at all, even just from a secular point of view. So they can see that on those origin of races, real roots, history of man, and the devolution of man. And I'm pretty sure they're all available and streaming if you haven't got them there, Joe. They are indeed. Thank you very much, John. Let's show John some appreciation.